Hi traders, welcome to this edition of Expert Market Analysis brought to you by Arante. This is generally a bi-weekly review and preview, so every other week of the market's key events and trading opportunities. Also, I'll just have you, uh, let you have a look at the disclaimer even. Um, I'll just run through some of the key objectives of this webinar. We think uh, markets are generally driven by themes which buyers and sellers relate to in order to enter and exit markets. These stories or narratives can be long-term fundamentals or short-term themes that increase or decrease in importance over time. I'll just run through what we hope to get through in the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, an absolutely packed week of risk events. We've uh, had that last week actually and they've picked up again this week and especially um, over the next few days for sure. Um, we will run through uh, earnings uh, in uh, Q3 earnings uh, around uh, the US stocks and US stock indices. So we'll look at some of those factors to do with the Magnificent Seven, so the tech titans, and look at some of the technicals around the S&P and the NASDAQ. Uh, we'll then um, quickly review last week's main events, which were um, some big data out of Europe, the ECB meeting, the Bank of Canada meeting as well, and we'll look at the Euro dollar, uh, dollar CAD, of course, as well as then looking at this week's um, central bank meeting already that we've had from the Bank of Japan, um, really important meeting, especially to do with dollar yen, uh, which is trading above 151 currently, so we'll just check out uh, what's been going on there uh, before then uh, looking at this week's main events, the Fed uh, policy announcement this evening together with the non-farm payroll report that's out on Friday of course the first Friday of the month uh, as well as then looking as well at uh, the Bank of England meeting which is tomorrow so an absolutely packed calendar full of risk events um, and hopefully we can decipher some of those and um, make sense of or of it all. Uh, if you do have any questions, of course, please do uh, ask them along the way and we'll try and answer those as we go or definitely at the end of the webinar. Um, and uh, hopefully we can help you on some of your um, yes, queries, uh, trade setups or, or technicals uh, or even fundamentals as well and some of the uh, themes that are going on, of course, in the market at the moment. Okay, firstly, I'll just um, pull up this chart. Uh, as I said, cut to um, stocks at the um, straight away, I think, is best to do so. We normally do this, actually, if uh, a lot of you guys uh, follow this webinar every other week, then, yeah, we generally look at stocks first, review uh, previous data and uh, big risk events and then look at obviously the current ones to come which is what I've just explained pretty much so um, firstly yes yeah, stocks corporate earnings really uh, getting another run past traders really I think we have uh, last week you saw was the big sort of um, 15 trillion dollars worth of um, S&P 500 companies were reporting um, this week uh, you can see the next biggest week of earnings uh, I think there's around 24% of the S&P 500 market cap reporting this week. Certainly the biggest name is Apple. They report um, tomorrow after the US close. Um, options markets, I think pricing a move of around just under 4% on the stock on the day. So that would be interesting. Uh, and the market's really focused on iPhone demand and consumer trends as well in China. Um, I think it's interesting that as of late, and I'll just pull up a chart, actually, the um, Apple chart, which you can see here. Um, really interesting that as of late, as I say, in the stock, uh, rallies have kind of been sold that you can see here. Um, and we put in this dotted line, which is from the August, mid-August low at uh, 171.96. Uh, we just sort of dropped below there before a move higher and then rallies again being sold. Um, black line here is a 200 day moving average, widely followed indicator. And you can see we dropped below there last Thursday when we had that big sell off in the NASDAQ generally. 
um, after a couple of earnings reports, which we'll get into. And then we've had three consecutive days of gains now, interestingly, and we're just below now at 200-day uh, moving average, which is at 170.89. This is in Apple. Um, so, yeah, pivotal point of um, sort of resistance support, you would think, uh, whether we can push above here and then that 171.96 level, which we've got from that mid-August low. Um, otherwise, if we roll over, then you've got, of course, that late September low at 167.62 and then uh, the late October low at 165.67. If we lose that, then we're sort of getting down towards uh, yeah, sort of 165 and below. So interesting uh, point of um, yeah price action for Apple and uh, of course its uh, report which comes after the close, as I say, tomorrow. Um, regarding tech stocks in general, though, of course, Q3 earnings, really, uh, we've had this sort of relentless optimism really powering those magnificent seven stocks. Those are the biggest stocks in the S&P 500 by market cap and ultimately uh, the broader indices, and they've been driving the broader indices, of course, this year. Uh, stepping back, though, if we think about it, tech stocks, they kind of entered 2023 with the odds kind of stacked against them because of the aggressive um, Fed rate hike cycle that we've seen. So long term Treasury yields provide uh, the rate for discounting companies future cash flows. So then a higher discount rate will lead to lower valuations. Uh, and this should be particularly true for stocks expected to deliver a lot of growth long into the future. So in a way, if you think about that sort of broader idea, then um, um, it is interesting that um, it's been sort of quite remarkable, really, that the Magnificent Seven have progressed so far with such headwinds. Um, and if we just look at a chart that I have here, uh, which bear with me one second, which really shows you the importance of uh, these seven big mega cap tech stocks uh, and the importance of them driving the S&P 500 uh, and its performance, as I say. Uh, but now, of course, these stocks have begun to roll over. Um, and given the sort of poor breadth that is driving the market, the wider market, seven stocks driving the 493 other stocks, if you like, in the S&P anyway, then aside from obviously this idea that AI is a genuine game changer uh, and it might, might uh, obviously we've had that peak in sort of AI mania, if you like, um, We've also, of course, had the idea that um, the Magnificent Seven will retain a bid as that they have this role as a comparative safe haven. So typically they have strong balance sheets and wide moats in uh, um, Buffett speak. But, but perhaps now after these earnings, just perhaps uh, the moats aren't quite wide enough. Uh, so regarding results. They haven't been too disappointing, especially for the Magnificent Seven, aside from Apple, uh, that we've yet to see. But hopes have sort of been hinging on the prospective growth of these platforms, um, looking to have these firms. Um, uh, yes, the prospective growth of the big Internet platform companies, sorry, uh, but then looking vulnerable to any uh, slightest disappointment. And I think if you look at um, some of these individual earnings, you just see the volatility around them. So take Alphabet, that's Google, of course, that saw its shares drop uh, almost 10% last week. That's the most since the pandemic in March 2020. Uh, and then the day after Google reported a smaller than expected profit in cloud report uh, computing, um, the report otherwise was healthy. But then also then you had Amazon stock tumble for two days after those earnings, as basically the market speculated that it might have similar problems in Amazon Web Services. And we got Amazon's results after the close last Thursday, looked to be ahead of expectations on both revenue and profits. But then after hours, trading showed that investors weren't still sure. And then during the and after the conference call, the company's stock has still not made up all the ground lost after the first tech results two days earlier. Uh, but then on Friday last week, it eventually closed up 7% or close to 7% uh, and had retraced most of those two days of losses. So um, as I say, volatility uh, has been seen among specific names, uh, and that's probably due to these stretch positions that 
investors have, big hedge funds have in these stocks. Um, this small, narrow breadth, which has driven the markets, as I say, uh, and then if these roll over, which you can see on this chart, then they have, then potentially if, um, and this is a great chart, because if you took uh, the S&P 500 as an equally weighted index, so every stock had an equal weight, then we would actually be in negative territory here for the year, whereas I think we're around up around 7%. In the S&P 500, as it is uh, weighted uh, very heavily skewed towards those big um, tech titans. So hopefully you've got a, a, an understanding here of how important these stocks are. Of course, uh, if we just look at um, uh, the wider indices then, and some of the technicals around those. So we'll full, first look at um, the S&P 500. That's here. So just some of the technicals then around here. Uh, interesting, uh, last week it was actually the S&P fell into um, correction mode. So that is more than 10% from the July high there. Remember the July high just above 4,600 and then we fell down to nearly 4,100. So just over 10% correction uh, from that high. Um, we're on track, or we have, uh, if you look at the monthly, yeah, three consecutive months of declines. You can see we haven't actually had that. Um, the last time we had that was actually during the pandemic. So um, interesting stat for you there. Uh, last time was March 2020 that we had three consecutive decline, monthly declines uh, in the S&P, the broader benchmark index, that is. Um, but then having said that, it's also interesting, I, I think, as well, uh, with volatility measures being relatively orderly. Um, so volatility measures, you can look at a number of different ones. Uh, the VIX, obviously, is Wall Street's fear gauge. Uh, if I just look at that briefly, that's here. Long term average is around 17. That's one seven. So if we get above 20, then that's pointed towards more volatility. Remember, the VIX is um, a gauge of um, the S&P 500 options um, and it's looking 30 days out so volatility around those options um, in a month's time or so um, and you can see well interesting we've dropped sharply actually so we're below 20 now at 18.24 in the VIX as I say 17's the average and if you just look at the monthly you can see when we spike higher you know above 80 during the pandemic um, that was a, 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 a you know historic spike of course but then you've had these periodic spikes where then you just move um, lower over the course of the next week or next few days so um, nothing major you can see and especially with war going on uh, we got up to sort of 23 but now we're back below 20 uh, and as I say that long-term average around 17 so interesting as I say three months of declines in the S&P but that has been relatively order orderly uh, in terms of volatility measures um, as well on the S&P if I just go back to that um, it's interesting, it fell at least 2% in a day over 20 times last year, but this has only happened once this year, and that was in February. So at least 2% in a day, it fell only once this year. So again, uh, just shows you sort of how we haven't had major volatility, um, but uh, we've had sort of a gradual decline, if you like. Um, so as for the technicals, um, this is the weekly chart and it's probably best going to the daily because the daily's got this black line which is 200 day moving average and just around 4200 i think we pointed that out a few weeks ago um strong sort of zone of support now resistance you can see we've got the halfway point of um the march rally uh from these march lows up to those summer highs the halfway point of that is at 4211 there uh, you've got the 50 day moving average now moved a touch higher 42 42 you can see um, and then we did move down below there last week uh, three days of losses in amongst uh, quite a few days of losses uh, but then we've had this bounce 
more recently, uh, and we also tapped that 41.18 level, 61.8 retrace level of that um, move higher. That's at 41.18, as I say, we moved down to 41.03 and just sort of bounced off that FIB level. So uh, yeah, next sort of uh, resistance around 4,200 and just above 42.11, 42.42. Otherwise, if we roll over, then sort of 4,100, 41.18 level should be some support. Um, okay, NASDAQ, just checking, uh, you can see this. Um, again, uh, we didn't quite touch the 200-day moving average. That's a, a bit lower in the NASDAQ 100. This is just below 14,013,955. Uh, we've got FIB levels in here as well um, from the sort of uh, this year's rally, really. Uh, so we've got the 38.2 at 13,932. That pretty much tallies with the 200-day moving average. So that should offer some strong support, really. As I say, we didn't get there. Uh, last week, we got down to 14.058. Um, so, uh, yes, if we can bounce, then potentially we've got this minor FIB level just below 14.700. And then we've got these the 50-day and 100-day moving average just above there, really, at 14, just below 15,000. So, um, potentially, yep, those are the levels we're looking out for. Just on the Dow as well, um, let's check out the weekly because I'll just show you. Uh, this level of uh, sort of resistance support, which are now below, firmly below 34,281. We've got a couple of moving averages there as well. We're down below those. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've got the 200-day moving average at 31,838. If we do lose last week's low at 32, uh, yeah, 32,327. Uh, then potentially we're down to 32,000 or so, which is these lows from March. Otherwise, yeah, we've got to move higher, move above the 50-day at 33,394, we would think. Bit messy, bit more messy though the Dow really compared to uh, the other couple of indices, I would say. Okay, uh, moving on now, let's uh, just check out last week's um, events quickly. Um, first of all, we had Eurozone PMI data um, and uh, that was, well, interesting because uh, we had the global data, uh, Eurozone PMI data, the economic deterioration seems to be broad based and it continued with both manufacturing and services sector declining. Um, certainly then the economy cooled or uh, continued to cool in Q4. Uh, and it's kind of what the ECB wants, but as um, both activity and prices fell, uh, it's kind of good news for the ECB, as I say, but um, not great news, obviously, for the wider economy. Uh, the risk is for the soft landing narrative, potentially uh, that activity then suddenly declines too fast. Uh, and currently, this risk is mainly present in the manufacturing sector, uh, and that continues to we be weaker than expected, um, dropped for a seventh consecutive month to 43.0, so way, way below that 50 sort of boom-bust level, uh, whilst the service sector, that's at 47.8. Um, just worth highlighting these because obviously then these leading indicators feeding into some of that um, data we've seen this week, say the GDP. But it, again, it contrasts heavily with um, the US data, the US PMIs. Um, they were better than expected. Both the manufacturing and services exceeded expectations. So another upside surprise in US macro data. And that sort of really underpins support for the dollar that we have been seeing. Uh, as well, last week, um, in fact, just before I get to uh, the currencies, is last week, again, we saw other data, uh, Q3, Q3 US GDP data of 4.9%, so beating expectations, um, strong across the board, private consumption, government consumption, um, all stronger than thought, expectations. We also had strong durable goods orders, uh, which, again, just painted this picture of a resilient U.S. economy. Um, as for um, uh, other risk events last week, of course, we had the ECB. Uh, just before I actually I get to the uh, euro dollar chart, let me just pull in a couple of um, charts or this chart for um, just showing us exactly what happened or is what happening as a broader picture in 
the eurozone economy you can see that pmi that i mentioned um which then ticked lower the composite uh, and then you've got gdp as well which came out again lower than expectations uh that was yesterday uh before i get to that the ecb otherwise um kind of as expected they kept rates unchanged at their meeting guided that they are done pretty much with additional rate hikes president lagarde seemed to be kind of on a mission not to rock the boat in terms of market pricing uh, and she succeeded pretty well and gave indications that this was kind of a stock taking meeting only because we don't didn't get any staff economic projections those come in december um, so those will be of interest for sure uh, but lagarde she highlighted uncertainty around the economic outlook remained confident that inflation would return to target if rates were maintained for a sufficiently long duration at current levels based on today's inflation uh, and certainly then given this poor data that we've been seeing in the euro area then the bar for additional hikes is pretty high um, all in all then uh, ecb i guess the outcome was marginally on the dovish side of expectations led to a minor do dovish market reaction um, uh, to the decision and the press conference uh, although that was sort of clouded by us data releases which were pretty strong as well at the time on thursday uh, markets really they're pricing the first full rate cut in june of next year um, so that uh, that did change really very much um, during, as I say, uh, the press conference and afterwards. Um, as for euro dollar, well, uh, we've still got this long term bear channel in here. Uh, we did break out of it. You can see um, last week, early last week, and looked pretty positive going up towards sort of 107. Uh, but that was a, an area of resistance. You can see. Uh, we got to 106.94 and then rolled over quite sharply again um, try to move higher up to 106.74 and then rolled over again so looking uh, not looking too great especially if we break sort of 105.21 so that is last week's low then we're back into sort of 105 territory and below and you can see the long-term cycle low from the um, early october is 104.48 uh, so just uh, a few levels to note there. Um, uh, I did mention the, the, the data this week has been quite important. So Eurozone inflation data that came in lower than expected. Uh, that's the prelim data for October. So the headline um, annual rate came in at 2.9%, uh, sorry, from 4.3%. Uh, consensus was 3.1%, so lower than expected uh, and quite a big drop there. Uh, base effects, um, I think, uh, uh, have been key. And then core inflation, which is what ECB policymakers focus on, that increased around 0.2% month on month for the second straight month, uh, which is the lowest two month average since spring of last year. Uh, but then the annual rate is still quite high at 4.2%. Uh, but gen generally, all in all, the disinflationary trend is continuing in the Eurozone, although the ECB will still look for further signs of softening price pressures, especially in services uh, where the inflation rate rose to just below 0.3% month on month in October. Um, so sort of good news for the ECB, but um, bad news potentially for the Eurozone, because obviously it takes hikes off the table for sure uh, by the ECB going forward. And as I mentioned uh, that we had that release of Q3 GDP data um, showed the Eurozone um, declining, uh, economy declining by 0.1% versus a plus 0.2% in Q2. Uh, and along with those PMIs that I highlighted earlier, then that does indicate that we, uh, weakness um, has continued into Q4. Um, so yes, that paints the picture, if you like, for um, the Eurozone and Euro dollar. Uh, hopefully that is pretty clear to you guys. Uh, and I don't see any questions at the moment, so that's all good. Let's just now go to um, the Bank of Canada meeting briefly as well. We had that last week, uh, looking at dollar CAD here. This is the chart. Uh, but the Bank of Canada, again, they more or less delivered on expectations. Um, 
uh, but kind of around the acknowledgement that tighter policy was acting to slow prices and that the kind of narrow runway to a soft landing was getting narrower. Um, the bank's policy statement kind of had a slightly hawkish edge to it. They altered the language in the statement itself, noted that progress towards price stability is slow and inflationary risks have increased. Um, then with forecast inflation forecasts, they were lifted. Um, and in fact, um, uh, the bank basically delayed the return to the 2% target until the second half of 2025. So the bar to a rate hike is high, but then the risk of higher rates will persist until there is clearer progress on core inflation. That's the key takeaway, really. Uh, slightly hawkish edge because they're still worried about inflation and this slow progress that we're getting uh, or not seeing to target. Um, as for dollar CAD, then uh, you could see, I just want to go to the monthly chart and you can see I've got in here this line here, which is uh, 137. And if I pull it back, um, it's been a, a quite an important level. You can see resistance and support there. And you can see then this big um, move higher last month broken uh, through it and it closed on the month at the highs really at 138.92 the highs and we closed at uh, well 138.73 so just below but very close to those highs um, which is of interest we think um, again you can see we've got a few dotted lines in here hopefully not too um, difficult to work out but you've got the March high here which we think is important at 138.62 we're just hovering around that and just above it so if we do stay above that then we're looking at these highs from back in October last year at 139.77 potentially but uh, really strong bullish momentum we're not overboard on the weekly if we go to the daily slightly overboard on the daily so we might have some consolidation around uh, that level that you can see there from March uh, 138.62. So that's a key level, but you can see it's for us bullish consolidation and potentially then a move higher, as I say, towards sort of 139.77 uh, if we do keep around this 138.62 level. That is dollar CAD. Um, okay, also uh, focusing on central banks, uh, there have been so many, of course, uh, last week. Uh, Bank Canada, ECB, and then also we've had the Bank of Japan um, just yesterday. If we just look at dollar yen, before I get to that, uh, well, the Bank of Ca uh, Japan, sorry, they tweaked their yield curve control policy. So that's the YCC policy at yesterday's meet meeting, basically by redefining the 10 year rate cap as a reference point rather than a rigid bound. Uh, and then they also removed a pledge to defend this level with offers to buy basically unlimited amount of bonds at 1%. Um, we did actually have a story indicating that tweak uh, before the meeting, uh, and we had this move from sort of uh, in dollar yen from 147, uh, 149.70 to 149. Um, uh, previous to the meeting. Uh, yesterday, the, the markets then sold the fact again on the announcement uh, and they pushed, obviously, you can see the cross back to above 150. Um, JGB yields, well, they sold off and then 10-year yields now trade five basis points closer to the rate cap of around 95 basis points. This was probably um, uh, another step then uh, of dismantling uh, the YCC policy altogether. However, the Bank of Japan still needs confirmation that inflation has sustainably moved above the 2% target before they're really ready to take bigger steps towards policy normalization. This is what the market wants to see, uh, but the Bank of Japan is still proving cautious and um, really quite steady uh, in uh, moving policy, tweaking policy, and then moving policy um, measures, other measures towards this normalization phase. 
Uh, they kind of are slowly recognizing higher inflation is not temporary because they have been saying that in the previous few months. Um, and they did actually move their inflation forecast significantly higher, particularly for the fiscal year next year, 2024, starting in April. Uh, they moved that to 2.8% from 1.9% previously back in July. Um, so slowly, slowly, really, it seems with the Bank of Japan and since the meeting, of course, um, we've had this big move higher in dollar yen. Japanese authorities kind of stepping up their efforts to contain really the, the unwanted impact on rates and FX from the meeting. Um, the Bank of Japan, as I said, they sort of announced unscheduled bond buying operations uh, actually this morning um, as JGB yields actually reached 0.97 percent uh, that high um, multi-year high actually uh, and then the top currency official at the finance ministry said all authorities are on standby to intervene in the fx market if needed um, and you can see then we're pushing up now towards well well above 150 150 120 we're currently trading at after pushing to a high of 151.72 yesterday that high today at 151.68 so possibly a a, a near-term level of resistance i've then got this dotted line in here from last year's last october's high which is at 151.94 before then a strong uh move lower and you can see that although um, uh, that was driven as well by yields, but then also, of course, um, Japanese authorities confirming they spent around $70 billion um, in uh, this defending uh, the currency uh, and eventually moving it lower. So just watch out for this, of course, um, be on the lookout for headlines um, saying the um, Japanese authorities have intervened uh potentially around this level remember they're looking at sharp movements which is what we saw yesterday uh and then obviously as well as the absolute level uh 151.94 is the previous um last october high okay let's move on now to um this week's main event obviously today's main event marquee event of the week really uh the fed meeting uh first of all if i just um uh, just get a couple of graphics for you, which hopefully paint the picture. First of all, you've got uh, this graphic with all the numbers we like to put on here. Um, FOMC, yes, all but certain to leave rates unchanged at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Focus will fall on guidance for the December meeting. There are no new dot plots at this meeting, uh, no new summary of economic projections. They come in December. So uh, it will be about guidance from uh, the statement of from Fed Chair Powell in the press conference. Um, money markets, of course, uh, and many Fed officials of the opinion potentially that the Fed is done with rate hikes. Uh, with the central bank proceeding carefully to let cumulative tightening continue to work through as inflation trends lower and the labour market rebalances. Uh, I've got in here um, inflation, of course, that did rise uh, a tenth from the previous report, um, but is sort of uh, trending lower overall. Um, Uh, the labour market, of course, remains relatively hot. We had that big number last uh, month in the non-farm payroll report, 336, and that pushed the three-month average up above 250 from 150 previously. So that is, again, uh, um, a concern and really highlights this resilience in the US economy. Um, although the labour market supply and demand is expected to rebalance going forward. Um, of course, then, uh, yes, it is this economic resurgence in Q3, uh, which is keeping risks slightly skewed to further hikes in the near term. I think there's around a, um, sorry, there's around a, uh, above a 20, well, I've got it on this graphic, 27% chance of a rate hike in December, uh, and that rises to above 30% in January. So potentially, um, uh, well, the odds are on the um, Fed standing pat now going forward, but those uh, there is a non-negligible uh, uh, chance, if you like, of um, a hike 
in December, January, as concerns still linger about a sort of possible episodes of kind of demand-led reflation. Um, the resilient economic and consumer data that's pushed out then the price of the first full 25 basis point rate cut um, back to sort of July, August time next year. Um, noting any rate cuts wouldn't be until late next year. That follows the September SEP showing a sort of 2024 end medium rate dock height, height by 20, uh, 50 basis points. Um, to uh five percent to five and a quarter percent that's the medium rate um dot plot for next year just on recent sort of fed speak if you like chair powell uh he said in a uh, an appearance uh middle of last month basically said incoming data over recent months had shown ongoing progress towards both um, the Fed's dual mandates, noting that the unwinding of pandemic-related distortions and restrictive monetary policy are now working to bring inflation down. Um, so he was seemingly satisfied with the current policy settings. Uh, he didn't take alarm to that sort of uptick in the September CPI report, um, really saying that the path is likely to be bumpy and take some time. Um, that really was similar to other Fed officials recently, uh, where he also acknowledged, and this is probably key for this meeting, acknowledged that the tighter financial conditions that we've seen from surging Treasury yields could then lessen the need for further rate increases going forward. That is key. Um, that tightening of financial conditions is sort of doing some of the heavy work for the Fed, um, so they have less need to raise rates because of um, the surging treasury yields tightening conditions as i say i think some in some quarters that is worth around a sort of 50 to 75 basis point rate hike so that's why they're on hold they have time to pause uh, and see whether the disinflation trend continues if that does which is what they're supposing especially with the lag the effects of all this cumulative tightening um, then potentially they are done as i say um, and um, we have seen the last rate hike in the cycle. Um, okay, that is the Fed. You can see here, I've just got a graph as well, just showing you that small possibility of a move higher before then rate cuts and um, rates moving lower going forward into 2024. I've also got headline inflation there, which has, as I say, um, in the headline ticked up a touch. Um, uh, and that will be something um, Fed Chair Powell is conscious of, but potentially then these surging yields, as I say, doing some of the work for the Fed. Um, I just want to concentrate as well on um, something else coming out today, which is the release of the US Treasury's quarterly refunding announcement, uh, where the attention will be on the size and also the mix of Treasury issuance. Um, going forward. Uh, this is important. A lot of you probably won't follow this, and especially um, it's kind of uh, the thing for fixed income for bond traders, really. Um, and it can be an event, and an event that isn't too well known. But if you recall, the August refunding announcement caused a bit of a stir, especially with Fitch um, downgrading US sovereign debt the day before the refunding announcement. Uh, basically, as the Treasury detailed increased auction sizes in its financing plans, and that proved to be the key driver behind then U.S. Treasury yields rising sharply from 4% to sort of 5% and above, which is what we got to uh, a few weeks ago, um, uh, and then um, that posing all these risks for um stock markets and um, risk assets in general. So just watch out for that announcement as well. That is today uh, a risk event for the bond market, uh, which could then tighten financial conditions further and then deliver sort of risk off conditions for the wider market. Um, it is well known now, a lot of people focusing on this and potentially then it is already out in the market, but um, it may have some tweaks to that uh, and then may affect markets um, going forward, as I say. Um, otherwise, uh, this week, staying in the US, we do have the non-farm payroll report. And before that, we have a load of uh, labor market data. Uh, ADP today, we had the employment cost index at 1.1%, I think. So still quite um, 
quite punchy there. We have the jolts job openings, that's the job vacancy data, um, and then jobless claims, the weekly jobless claims tomorrow, and then ahead of Friday's non-farm payroll report. Uh, you can see from the graphic headline, I think is expected to rise around 170 just above there, and that's easing obviously from that blockbuster 336K uh, we saw last time. Um, yeah, uh, we also had revisions um, last time as well, noticeable positive revisions, nearly 120,000, so watch out for those this time as well. Uh, the jobless rate, that's seen as 3.8%, um, which is remaining steady from the previous number. Uh, and then wages expected to rise by 0.3%, so a tick higher than 0.2% um, prior. Um, so all in all, kind of still a pretty hot jobs report is expected. Um, possibly, um, if it is higher than expected, the 170, then it will push out those expectations of rate cuts. Uh, again, uh, the first one priced by around July next year. Uh, while, of course, a cool report, a cool report, uh, could see the opposite and then see rate cuts priced in and then those hikes, uh, as I say, 27% in December, 40% around that chance of a rate hike in January, those get cut if we do see a softer report. Um, just remember the September release, that saw unemployment rise, wages cool, but then the headline was a big beat, so it sort of offset that slightly, uh, although we did have those revisions, as I said. So, um, yeah, really important data. Um, I think generally a dollar should probably hold its gains unless the Fed feels the need to emphasize the tightening of financial conditions and drops its tightening bias. Uh, and then to, as, as similar with this report, uh, would have to be probably substantially cooler to um, see some selling in the dollar. We do have ISM data as well, manufacturing and services, um, important data that is uh, released um, today shortly actually uh, and then also friday the ism services always important data really expectations uh, for manufacturing uh, unchanged print actually still in contractory territory but well above levels typically seen during a recession and their services they are expected to tick modestly lowered but still above 50 around 53.0 um, and that is really the uh, highlights the resilient consumer, uh, which continues then to drive relatively healthy growth in the wider economy. Um, okay, that is the US. Hopefully that's given you a good rundown of what's happening there. Um, I will just now go to, in fact, let's just go now to uh, the other main event, the Bank of England policy meeting that is uh, out tomorrow. Expectations are for the MPC to stand pat on rates. So the um, really a 90% chance, I think, of um, such an outcome. Expectations for no change really follow suit from the MPC's decision in September to pause its rate hike cycle um, via, that was a five to four vote. Um, dissent coming from Cunliffe, Green, Haskell and Mann after the August CPI data came in cooler than expected. Um, with services inflation falling to 6.8 from 7.4. The MPC expectation was 7.2. But then since that meeting, September's data um, has held steady at 6.7, while services, um, that print ticked higher to 6.9 from 6.8%. Nonetheless, uh, I think expectations are for a step lower in price pressures for the October release. As last year's steep increase in household energy bills drops out of the annual comparison. Uh, also, we've had headline wage growth, earnings growth that has slowed from 8.5% to 8.1%. That is a key measure for the MPC. Uh, and then the unemployment rate actually dipped to 4.2% in August versus the MPC's forecast of 4.1%. Um, Really then, in any event, it's kind of a lack of any notable notable hawkish developments since the prior meeting really means the policymakers will continue to sit on their hands. Uh, the vote uh, I've sort of put in here could potentially be seven to two from that 5.4. Interesting, Cunliffe, one of those dissenters, has now been replaced by um, Breeden, who will probably side with the consensus. 
So it could be 6372 vote. However, even if, of course, all policymakers are kind of in agreement, agreement rates should be held, uh, the policy statement will likely probably continue to reiterate that uh, further tightening would be needed if evidence of more persistent inflation pressures is seen. Uh, that will probably be kept in there and then probably likely signal um, or markets will look to then um, the uh, the um, accompanying NPR uh, and those polled by Reuters really believe that inflation will average around uh, 3% in 2024 and then 2.2% in 2025 returning to target. Really that return not coming until Q2 2025. Uh, and then on the growth front, polling I think suggests uh, the UK will avoid a recession, but the outlook will remain weak. And that is uh, the issue really with 2024 annual growth seen at just 0.4%. Okay, uh, that is the Bank of England meeting. If we just look at cable, um, so that is sterling against the dollar, which is this chart here. Just checking you can see that, which you can. Um, I'm just checking we don't have any questions either, uh, which we don't, which is good, but please do ask any questions if you do have any along the way. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, cable chart, you can see in this long term bear trend, uh, bear trend, bear channel, series of lower lows, lower highs. And we're still in that. You can see we've tapped it, tried to tap it a couple of times, the upper band, and then we've sold off. So. Uh, potentially, yeah, we had that yesterday moving up to sort of a, just above 122 um, and then we rolled down and uh, are selling off marginally today. But obviously, we've got the Fed meeting first up. Uh, if we do lose then, probably last week's low at 120.69, looks like we're then going to this cycle low at 120.37. Um, and then the top of the band is probably around here, 122. And then you've got uh, resistance probably above at 122.88 before then these two highs here at 123, 31, 37 or so. So that is cable, a lot of risk events going on. Um, hopefully that's proved of use to you guys. Uh, really good to have you all on the call and we'll speak to you in a couple of weeks.